Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Susan B. Eirich, PhD. Susan is a licensed psychologist and biologist who blends nature and human psychology into an eco-psychology and spiritual ecology perspective that she has christened Reconnection Ecology. Her unique approach to global conservation and preservation is communicated through her startling and heart opening stories and videos that demonstrate why deeply understanding wild animals can heal the trauma that humans, animals, and our earth are currently experiencing and inspires the global community to expand wildlife corridors throughout the continents. Her local Yellowstone to Yukon wildlife corridor is the last intact wildlife mountain corridor in the world. Dr. Eirich has taught psychology at universities around the world, worked in a maximum security prisons, developed a university counseling center, founded the Earth Fire Institute, and has lived in remote corners of Nepal, the mid and far east, the Northwest Territories, and the Amazon Forest. Susan, thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm so excited to have our conversation. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, my first question, just to clear this for folks that aren't aware of it, what is a what is the U the Yellowstone to Yukon Wildlife Corridor, and why is it the last intact wildlife mountain corridor in the world? What does that mean, actually? So wildlife corridors. There was a wonderful artist, naturalist who grew up with artists, and he was down here where I am near Grand Teton National Park, and then he was way up in the Yukon around a campfire and said, "You know what?" everything up there is the same as down there. It's one connected ecological unit, even if it's 2000 miles apart. And he began to realize the importance of saving the equivalent of wildlife corridors. So wildlife corridors are places where animals can travel safely. If there's disease, climate change, whatever, they can travel to new areas. If they're chopped off, there's development all around an area, they'll eventually die out. They can't get anywhere. So wildlife quarters, he had that idea. Now there are wildlife quarters around the world, big ones, little ones, but it's the last intact, best last intact mountain wildlife quarter in the world. And that's because of development. We just chop things up without thinking and without realizing that if we put a house here, we've just cut off a 6,000 year old migration corridor. That's actually true over in Jackson. There's one little narrow place where antelope have traveled for 6,000 years. And because of two mountains coming down to a stream, it's the only passage. And people wanted to build a ranch right there. Fortunately, there was enough of a real beginning realization and outcry that they stopped it. But that's where we're here we have the benefit of a lot of people who are very environmentally oriented and people who've done the research. People are doing that all around the world without a clue that this is a death knell for migrations or for species survival. So it's really important. Uh, the best dream is to have wildlife corridors interwoven throughout the continents. From A to Z, we, we need to think large on landscape areas, but also in a particular area, if you if you develop the last little water hole and you just want to be right by the river where the last berries are to, to think and to work, what's really important and, and good is to work with your local planning and zoning because a lot of people don't want to do harm to wildlife. And if they understood it, what they were doing, they would gladly build a little differently. 
So it's partly up to us to tr and planning and zoning to inform people of that. We're actually working on a pamphlet now to give to all the realtors in the valley to say, this is what, this is a ma magical place. This is what you need to do if you want to have the wildlife last. But some animals won't even cross, like a pine marten won't cross something more than I think 400 yards open space. So if we, we can devastate a species without having a clue. What you're saying just brings up such an important point. And I'm, I'm going to go back to the notion of reconnection ecology, <laughs> like being connected as human beings to the environment that we live in and the ecosystem that we live in to be cognizant of our impact and, and to be aware of these existing patterns in yeah. nature. So, so you come from, I'm going to, I always say about myself, I have a checkered past. I would say the same of you, given your background here, you know, all this variety, having worked, um, being trained as a psychologist and a biologist and working in prison systems. And how, how did you arrive at eco psychology and spiritual ecology that makes up reconnective ecology? Well, those are both terms coined by other people. Those are fields in and of themselves. Um, the work I do has an aspect of both. Um, and I, I termed it reconnection ecology because the thing that we're missing most is a deep connection with all life. That, when I say all life, that includes humans. <laughs> Um, we're somehow disconnected from everything, our own brilliance, our own hearts, our own spirituality, which is bad enough, but we're also disconnected from other life forms. And even worse, we're disconnected from how life works. So we keep interrupting and disrupting all the, <laughs> all the, the, the ecosystems around us without a clue. Um, so my, what I'm working on right now is helping us, and I say us rather than people, because if I say helping people, it implies that I'm different and I'm not. We're all in this together in a great big mess, but we're all massively creative also. So um, I've started asking people to share stories that are profound to them. I call them transformational stories, stories and secrets that they might have held their whole life afraid because they'll be called crazy or stupid or, or they don't want to share it because it's so sacred to them that they don't want any negative energy on it, but it's hidden and often hidden and therefore stays um, un, undeveloped within them. And so what I'm trying to do is invite us, and I have storytelling circles I do online, and then I do workshops at conferences and stuff too, is to invite us to share those stories. And the most magical thing happens. People just open up. It's like it's like a dam or like a, in my last little e-newsletter, I wrote about a flower called the touch me not. It's, it's, it's a jewel weed, you know, it's, it's got this ripe little seed pod just waiting. And when you touch it, the lightest touch, it just explodes forth. Wow. That's what it feels like. I was at a conference the other day and they asked me what I did. And I just said a couple of sentences and out came a story that let his 77 year old mother share something with him that she hadn't shared in 77 years. It's just astounding. It feel, it's a positive thing. It's like we're all... Uh, is, I wouldn't say it's a groundswell, maybe it's a groundswell. Um, we have these magnificent stories waiting to be told and shared and, tr and trusted. So um, to me, it's a beautiful thing because it's beautiful for us humans. And it's beautiful because of the consequences of how we relate to nature. It's a total winning scenario. Um, and so the reconnection ecology is not enough just to remember the story or be encouraged to allow it to come forth um, is to remember it and then to trust that it's true because we're so often told it isn't, it's not possible or it's not important. The very things that are most important we're told are not important, art, beauty, uh, connection with other living things, that's, making money is what's important. Right. And, we're just, and we're so brainwashed, it's really a, a huge human tragedy. So when, when 
Uh, so it's to reconnect and trust it. And part of the work I want to do is help us, myself included, trust it more and then integrate it. So it's not just there as a memory, trusted, but we integrate it into our very being. So we have this experience that now changes how we feel about this, that, or the other. Oh, some connection with nature. And then from integrating it and starting to live from there, we start to act on it. Because loving isn't enough, reconnecting isn't enough. It's only enough if we then act for the beloved, if you will. That's, that's beautiful. Um, what you're expressing is a movement into connection, which moves to inspiration. And from that inspiration comes action that is inspired action, which is an entirely different kind of action than the doingness that so many of us engage in, right? To feel that we're accomplishing something. Yeah, that's a very important point. And as grounded in something that's real, but real in terms of nature. So it's coming forth from a depth of deep knowledge and wisdom that's even beyond us, so that the actions will have that quality as opposed to, gotta fix this, gotta fix that, gotta, da, 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 yeah, right. which, which works in the short term, but not in the long term. Because it's disconnected. Yeah. So people love stories. And you have you are rich with stories. I'm wondering if there might be an inspirational story that you could share that would be an experience so that people understand the power of of what you're talking about. Goodness, how to choose. I'm I'm gonna share a story that a woman shared with me. I can also share stories from here, but um a story that which illustrated it was there was a woman who was in a violent, abusive home in a city. And when she was four, she managed to wander around and find in the depths of the city, there was this tree sitting back from a gas station. And she, um, it, was, it was short and it had branches that cradled her just perfectly and she was able to crawl into it and lie in there and feel embraced and feel safe and she visited that tree regularly from age four till age 17 when she went away to college and she said it was she felt she didn't feel like it was an idea that she was embraced she was embraced that tree saw her as beautiful and she felt the tree as beautiful and she was home and it was healing it's where she could heal from all the abuse right in the middle of a city which is to me a very important point because my stories have to do with bears and wolves and people can easily say well i don't have those it makes no difference as long as it's another living being the connection if it's real it's rich and healing so she went away and started um, a business. And the business is, was, is profoundly connected to life, um, all the good things that a business should be, and is based on plants. And she actually didn't make that connection till we talked. That's what I mean about trust and begin to integrate it. She actually did integrate it in her life, just not consciously. And she has a special relationship with plants. Her house, tiny house is filled with plants. And she, someone asked her, well, how do you know how to water them? She said, well, they tell me. It's obvious. <laughs> so that will be an example of, of a deep connection and a nurturing into something that actually took place. And then, you know, she gives money back and her plant business is based on uh, very healthy plants. Um, that support us and life, etc. So that would be one example of that reconnection arc I'm talking about. Transformative stories. Go ahead. You're, you're talking about the transformational power of nature too. <laughs> and, and knowing that we do commune with nature. And well, nature communes with us. We don't always listen. Th that's right. That's really true. And here's the, I just have such a vivid image that you just painted. It's, it reminds me of the story, the giving tree, but, um, it, you know, to the, the mother tree, mm -hmm. 
just so beautiful. And I know there is such a thing as the mother tree too, there is. which is r- remarkable. Uh, there's su- there's such a richness there in in storytelling, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Pachamama Alliance, and they're talking mm-hmm. about creating a new story, creating mm-hmm. a new dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a topic that has come up over and over again as how we can create new possibility is through storytelling, through mm. creating a story. So you you talked about your stories are largely about bears and wolves, which is a great segue into Earth Fire. So maybe you could give us a little bit of background on Earth Fire and what it is, how you started it, and then maybe you'll share a wolf or or bear story if you're really, really good. Okay, I'll be as good (laughs) as I can. (laughs) So I always loved nature as far as I could remember. Um, And I always loved wolves, which has made no sense because I'd never met one. But most of us have that experience. We somehow connect to a species. We don't really know why. But I thought, that's absurd. You can't have a wolf. Um, And then I came from a a family background that was not easy. And... um, went into therapy, was lucky enough to find a really good therapist. Took me 13 tries. Wow, that's persistence. I knew something was wrong and I knew I needed to do something about it. And I walked into the 13th and said, that guy knows something. And I stayed with him, studied with him maybe 20 years on and off. But it was so fascinating to understand within our human limits, just how we work, that I said, this is great. And I went on and got a degree. My original degree was in biology because I loved it. But at that time, ecology barely existed and it was really science oriented. It just didn't speak to me. So I enjoyed having the science background. So I decided to go into psychology and I did. Didn't learn anything that I thought was tremendously helpful in school my PhD. What I learned that was of real value was with this guy who only had a master's, but he knew, he quit school because he said there wasn't anything there. Um, that may have changed, I don't know, but he was brilliant and he helped me connect to myself. I had been disconnected and did not know how to live. And, and when you're disconnected, you're off balance and you spend your life off balance and we can't really live our human potential. Um, and, and with, with anxiety, depression, mental, whatever it is, if we're off balance. So working with him, I was able to almost slot into myself and become balanced. And that, that was such a gift that I said, I have to, I can't just let it go. If people come to me, I'm going to see them. I'm not going to advertise. So I have a small private practice um, just because it was such a gift but that wasn't enough because I always loved wolves <laughs> and I always loved nature. And I thought, you know, I don't want to sit in an office all day long and went overseas because I liked traveling and I wanted to learn how to see through others' eyes. And when I came back, I decided I was going to go from psychology back into nature and biology again and um, got a job with the Nature Conservancy, running a Nature Conservancy preserve, which is great. Um, too much administrative work, not enough animals, but it was nature and, and land and trees and, and sharing the beauty with people. That was great. And then I heard about the possibility of a woman who just started breeding wolf dogs that hadn't existed before then. It was a brand new thing. I heard wolf hybrid. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, I'm getting one. So I did. <laughs> And I made a commitment to that animal. It was very unknown at that time. Were they safe? Are they wolves? Are they dogs? Are they schizophrenic because they're mixed up, et cetera? So I made a commitment to him that I would never leave him alone. And he went into movie theaters beneath skirts. He went into conferences behind skirts. He went into boardrooms in uh, downtown Manhattan because I said, you want me there? He comes with me. And the most interesting thing was I went into a boardroom and a plot was a the top floor of, of I think it was a DuPont building or something in downtown Manhattan. And that's where the board meeting was. 
and I had my, him with me. He was not small at the time, but I went through um, swinging doors and he was a bit of a wimp. <laughs> and I think a hair got caught and he yelped. And you know, the bottom floor are all these stores of big buildings. People came rushing out, glaring at me. How could I have a, be- it was so it was great. <laughs> and then I went all the way up to the top completely sterile there might have been a plastic plant and everybody rushed out there was this warm gorgeous reddish furry creature and everyone wanted to touch him it's like everybody wants the life you know anyway because of him I traveled around the entire country to meet everyone who had one and in the process met my current partner who had wolves wow now how does somebody have wolves he was training him for movies. Okay. He was part of the animal film industry. So I would have, imagine there's some licensure that's necessary. Yes. Yeah. Fortunately, there's a lot of licensure. And also to breed, breed wolf dogs, I would imagine there that might there be. weren't any at that time. Interesting. It had she just started it? She just did it. Maybe other people had done it before, but she started it legitimately, so to speak. Kept records and stuff, and it became a thing after that. Mm-hmm. So when I met him, it was really clear he was he's a genius at connecting with wild animals. I mean, he becomes the animal. I, I, I tease him that he's not really human at all, just human. If he's a badger, with a badger, he becomes a badger. If he's with a wolf, he becomes with a wolf, et cetera. So when I met him, it was like an instant, we have to do something together. I love these animals. I want to share them with the world. I don't know how to handle them. I'm better at it now, but it's his gift. So we decided to join forces. Um, And in the process, he had some wolf puppies that were left over from a film. And he invited me to come down and help raise them for, I had some time off. I'd taken it to the- The concept, I don't know, left over (laughs) from a film. So please just elaborate. What does that mean? Films will, will take get animals that they need for the movies. And he he wanted to make sure that the puppies were safe. So he took them. There wasn't any provision outside of what he might provide? You'd have to ask him this because it was a while ago and it wasn't my, p- part of my life at that time. Okay. Um, I do know there was a lot of problem with the mother with introducing her to it's, it's too complicated. Um, so the raising of those puppies, the connecting with those puppies is so profound. So they all got some version of something like Parvo. So they hadn't been vaccinated. So they needed a 24-hour care. Parvo is most frequently deadly, right? Mm-hmm. But wild animals are different. Okay. <laughs> Not, they're different in the life force. Interesting. The life, the life force is strong. I, ha- I have doggies. I've had kitties. I love them all equally. But the life force is different in wild animals. Stronger. So did these wolf puppies become pets? You can't make a pet of a wild animal. You can make a companion, an equal companion. So please talk and in, speak into that. Um, the well, first thing you ask how I founded Earth Fire, um, I felt totally, completely, hopelessly lost in love. Yeah, I felt like a, the mother hormones were rushing in me, which I suspect they were. And I said, I have to share this. The same thing. It's, this is too beautiful. This is too profound. Who these beings are. I can't let them kill wolves mindlessly. There's a negative end, and I have to share the beauty of them, which is the positive end. And so I named them Moonbeam and Autumn Dancer and Star Dance and and Wind Song, and one of them I called Earth Fire. And you can't start an organization called Moonbeam. That's very (laughs) (laughs) cool. So they were all equally special, but I thought that was the most appropriate name because of her. I started this, uh, found this organization to share the absolute wonder of other living beings. In my case, animals, but plants are just as, just as magnificent. 
And so you started with these wolf puppies and now Earth Fire is, is a rescue center and beyond. Yes? No? What would you call it? Two. So we got, it was a huge deal to get all the licenses, particularly where we are, where they want to kill all the animals that we have, that, you know, the terrible killing of, of bears and wolves and everything. But we have all the, all the licenses, et cetera, necessary. Um, so you have bears and wolves and coyotes and cougars. We have, we have animals that are native to the Yellowstone Yukon Wildlife Corridor. So the nat- this is their natural environment. And how do you come by these animals? Um, probably as many stories as we have animals. Um, They've been injured or... Injured, orphaned, some were captive bred for film, and then the people couldn't keep them anymore because there is a whole industry of breeding captive wildlife. Um, some of it's legitimate for, for movies or education. And you know, there's a whole underground as well. Um, but the ones we got were from legitimate because we have all the licenses. And so- Some came from fur farms. Wow. One come from roadside zoo. Another it was a child of divorce, like the woman had a lot of bears and they couldn't keep them anymore for the, for the industry. Wow. So, and then we also do rehabilitation. Is, so if animals are injured in the wild, the ones that were allowed to under our license were not allowed, sadly, to do bears or wolves. They just, they just want to kill them. Wow. Um, but animals that we do have, uh, we take in, keep away from people, and rehabilitate and release. And the animals who live here for life, we, that's where the incredible stories come because we're with them for life and form relationships that you can't do in the wild and you can't do in a zoo. And then we begin to see who these beings are and the stories are just amazing. Well, I, 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 we need to hear some stories. <laughs> For sure. And, and actually, I want to circle back around to you saying you can't make a pet of a wild animal. You can become a companion, mm-hmm. equal companion. So, and you're saying that the life force in wild animals is, entire, is different. So can you Stronger. tell us about the animals? Tell us about your, the wolves and how they're different from dogs. And your relationship, what's different? I adore dogs. I adore dogs equally to adoring wolves. So there's not anything negative when I say they're not as smart. (laughs) Their brains are one, the research, basically one third less than a wolf's. Well, proportional. A lot of that is um, sensory abilities. The wolves are simply incredible. Intuitive abilities, survival abilities. Um, but what we've done is we've taken dogs and there's something called neoteny, like neo for newborn neoteny, um, where we've bred them. So they stay juvenile, Mm. juvenile features. The noses are a little flatter. Um, so they never reach full maturity as a wild animal would. That's why they're always looking up to us. Wolf puppies are always looking up to us too until they get independent. That's where the problem comes in where you can't keep them as a pet anymore, whatever. But um, so dogs are dependent on us. You'll have a dogs and breeds who, who push the independence, especially when they come into adolescence, but nothing like a wolf. They're always dependent on looking to us for, for love and support, et cetera. Wolves don't look at, at us any of that. They're independent, vibrant beings. Now the love can be intense between us but it's more a love between equals. And you can't take the wild out of an animal and neither should you. Right. And it's, and it's a, it's a danger to believe that you can. Right. Yeah. It's sort of a danger to humans. It's usually mostly a danger to the animal because then they get too used to humans and they do, and then they do something and then we kill them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I'm interested in speaking a little bit more about wolves because there have been so many campaigns to eradicate wolves. And there was a marvelous movie, which I'm sure you're familiar with, called How Wolves Change Rivers. Mm -hmm. 
and that's right um, up here in Yellowstone. Amazing, amazing. Maybe you would do a quick summary of that. Um, but the but the the thing that it must be particularly heartbreaking for you being so directly and viscerally connected with wolves to see this carnage. And I, I'm just wondering how, how can you speak into that? What, what do you have to say around that? Everybody handles that differently based on what their own capacities for horror are if you will. Um, I can't spend too much time attending to it or I would get lost. I wouldn't be able to function. So I, I keep up with it. I keep, I know about it, but the details are just too horrible. Yeah. And I think it's a mistake to keep showing it too, because then people just turn off because it's too horrible. Um, and there are two ways of approaching conservation both important. One is to show the horror, so it activates us, but it doesn't activate us that much. It doesn't activate us that long-term. When people hear about the horrors in New Jersey, about Idaho, they may send some money, they might write a letter, uh, both of which do nothing. Um, you have to change attitudes and change the power structure. Ironically, most of the people in the country do not want the wolves hurt. It's a few powerful ranchers and cultists. I say cult because the hatred of wolves is like a cult. It's not rational. It's, a it's, fear. Not, it's like a, a primal fear, I think, on some level. It's also hatred. Hmm. Um, so you can approach the conservation, but you have to know the facts. You don't have to have bloody corpses in front of your eyes to know the facts. Um, but the other side is to show us, because we work better, as you said earlier, with a, with a beautiful story to work towards. We work better as humans. We're more motiv motivated on hope and beauty, um, motivate us better to live in a world where we're truly one community. And the joy of being, feeling all the life forms, incredible life forms around you. Um, so I've chosen to work in that direction, to share the beauty and what could be and the wonder and to have the connection that people are able to make with the animals here, motivate them to do something. Matter of fact, it's a requirement for a visit here. You're not gonna come just, you're not gonna just come and visit and have a nice experience. No, no. Go, else, go somewhere else if you want to do that. Um, so, I, so with respect to wolves or all of it, um, I've chosen to work in trying to shift attitudes because laws don't work long-term. They can be perverted easily given the political times. It has to be our hearts and minds that are changed so that the culture says no. So that's where I tend to work. And that's my answer to, your, to that issue. The strength of love is much more powerful than the than the um, the negative enforcement of seeing the images or hearing about yeah. something. But when we are passionate, that deadens us, terrorizes us, and is important, but can't be overdone, or we just shut down. Yeah. So that's really what sustainability now is founded on is cre is providing uh, hopeful stories to show people what works to show people that we have options that we can create a better future with that it's not just about how awful things are. Mm -hmm. So wildlife corridors is a story of hope we now have them around the world. And countless animals have been saved because of that and that actually started with the vision of one man. Wow. Well, who is that? His name is Harvey Locke. Is there a book that you might recommend? You, anybody can look up Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. It's called Y to Y in short, like literally the letter Y to Y. Just look it up online and you'll find all you need. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll, we'll put a link to that on our website when we post this. And there's another one called Wildlands that has the idea of integrating wildlife corridors around the, around the continent. And there's another one called the Center for Biological Diversity that works on more immediate short-term fixes as a balance to the larger picture. They're all 
um, very grounded in, in reality, if you will. Good Wonderful. Good Wonderful. So you're working with the scary animals. You're working with the animals, and I'm saying scary in big air quotes. Mm -hmm. um, you're working with the, the animals that are a threat to human survival, according to most humans that are feeling quite separate from nature. These are animals that would inspire fear for most people, bears, cougars, coyotes, um, predators. So how, uh, what you're talking about- You also have a very scary porcupine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry to interrupt, go ahead. <laughs> sweet, sweet. So um, I, I'm wondering what, I'm sure you have stories that you can share to help us be re-educated even in this moment. And, I, and then I, you mentioned also when people come there, they don't just come, they don't just have permission to just have a nice experience and go away. So I'd like to hear more about that too. Uh, whichever you'd like to speak about first. So the point of the Institute here is we're a sanctuary for the animals, but they also are um, emissaries. There's a little film at the bottom of my email called Emissaries from the Wild that people can see if they want to. And they're emissaries be just for the very reason that you said people are terrified or they have a ridiculously romantic mo notion, which is equally unfair to the animal. You're not seeing it for who it is. Um, so we have um, custom visits. So we're not open to the general public because I want people to have the time to really connect with the animals. And also I'm not having 100,000 people coming to look at them. Right. So the idea is to come and have a visit and spend time and meet with them. Mm. And then that experience is very profound for a lot of people. Um, so that's the point of it. We've had, we have a grizzly bear here who um, was a normal bear bear. As you, as you would think of him ordinarily. And then for some reason, he started to have trouble walking and he ended up not able to walk at all. You have to pull himself along by his front paws. And uh, the vet said, did various stuff. I'll go into all the details, which are all really interesting. Um, said, well, there's nothing you can do. What are you going to do? Put a diaper on a grizzly bear? Um, put him down. And I said, no way in hell. There's a light of life in his eyes. I am not doing it, but I didn't know what to do. And so I called a friend of mine called Penelope Smith, who's sort of like the grandmother of interspecies communication. Mm. And I have a lot of respect for her. And she had visited and she had met him, Teton Totem. And she was living down in Arizona at the time. And I called her and said, Penelope, I don't want to put him down. Do you have any thoughts? And I was thinking glucosamine <laughs> and nutrition, I didn't know. All I knew was I was going to reach out to everything I could to try and save this bear. And she said, let me see what I can do. And next day she called back and said, any change? I said, what? <laughs> You're a thousand miles, what do you mean? She said, well, I connected with him. She was, a, she was a medical intuitive before she worked with animals. She could feel energy blocks. In this case, she was feeling energy blocks in a bear a thousand miles away, which seemed absurd from a regular point of view. But I wasn't going to say no. And I said, no. And she called the next day. I said, maybe a little bit of difference. And the next day, he had dragged himself over to a pool that we had and dropped his right hind leg in it and started to move it like hydrotherapy. Wow. Wow. And then she called me back periodically the next two or three months. That was in September. By November, he was walking. That's a whole other story, um, the medical aspect. But the point of, of what people get out of coming was he went into hibernation and I was panicked. How was he going to be? He made lined his den extra warm, et cetera, this arthritis, et cetera. Um, and he came out sweet. He came out so sweet that when people, not always, not everybody, but uh, first time someone came out 
and met him after that or somewhere near the first time, that person burst into tears. And she couldn't explain it, except that she felt like she'd gotten some kind of transmission wow. or some kind of... So I didn't expect any of this. So that's part of my, my own journey, coming from science, etc. But it happened quite often. There's something in him that switched because of, I, I think, I can only, I don't know any of these things for sure. My guess is a human being reached out, connected and helped him. And now he had a different feeling about humans, not a stay away. And there's stories up before humans became so aggressive with guns, et cetera. The stories of bears just being very peaceful with people. But since we've been afraid of them, we hunt them, we trap them, we collar them, we tranquilize them, we harass them. Uh, and one thing I will say about bears is they have long memories. Mm. They hold a grudge. Interesting. We think about the elephant's memory, right? But mm -hmm. And so um, much of we don't know if much of the fear we have of, of animals like grizzlies is based on how we treat them. That would make sense. Now, I did see one bear once. Um, he was in captivity. And he had a crazy look in his eye. Not that different from when you see a human who's crazy. So all bears aren't gentle giants. They've got every single temperament that we have. Some are, and some are aggressive, and some are potentially a little crazy. No, it's interesting. You talked about this, um, the medical intuitive who became an animal communicator. And that may be a very... Uh, bizarre concept for a lot of people who haven't been exposed to that idea. And yet, when we think about our own nature, when we think about how we can be in a room and somebody walks in and you don't see them, but you can feel the energy of the room change, mm. it, it makes ultimate sense that that would be the means by which we would communicate with animals is through that felt sense in so many ways, because we don't have the same language. Yeah. My partner thinks that's how animals do communicate with one another because they don't have language and because they have to. And yeah, it's not that different either from having a sense of when your cat is sick or your dog is sick. If you're close to another being, that the connections increase and you feel it. So it's not, it's simply that some people are more talented than others at it and they've developed it more. But we all have that capacity. So with a scientist who talks about, um, did research on dogs, how do dogs know when the owners are coming home? And the telepathy, he's got ironclad proof that dogs know when the owners are coming home. He's got video of the dog, video of the owner far away. So it's, it's not that far out when you think about your own deep connection with one of your own animals. Well, and the thing is that I don't know that we typically think of it as telepathic because we think you, we're so oriented to believing well, we're observing something rather than that we're feeling something. I mean, I, a yes. lot of us. <laughs> Right. That so we're not we're not necessarily considering that we're activating our telepathic capacities. Right. Or you, or you could call it intense empathy, too. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want the word to turn people off. It's simply but it because it can because of all the implications. And I'm glad you brought that up for that reason. But it's something we all experience deeply. Mm hmm. Deeply. And it sounds to me like that is very much at the heart and no pun intended mm -hmm. at the heart of the work that you do mm -hmm. by having people connect to these beings that might otherwise inspire terror. Like to be to be able to, in so many ways, when we talk about psychology, we talk about facing our fears. Right. And how befriending the shadow is is a place of empowerment and here to um, be facing an archetypal creature that is alive and to transcend that that um, 
limiting belief and fear and it's got to be transformative yeah it is on so many levels so i i'm wondering if i know that this is your work this is your heart this is your work this is your your um your story is creating creating the opportunity for this reconnection. So what does that look like to come and, and visit? And, and maybe you could share another story or two that exemplifies your work. Well, visitors, I said, are limited. Um, and then we do, do retreats too, so where people have a longer time too, but we only do a few a year. Um, again, because I don't want to overwhelm the animals and because I want I want to keep the quality of the experience um, so, so that people who come have an opportunity to really connect to the animals and the land because the land itself is wild and beautiful. Um, what was your other question? I, I'm, I guess I'm wanting to understand this. I, it, maybe you could share a story that really exemplifies your work and the essence of this reconnection, this, this story of the young child with the tree and her relationship with it was magnificent, but I'm wondering about bears and wolves and cougars and. Well, I don't know your audience. So we might have to do another one with some of the more far out stories another time. Oh, give us one <laughs> far out story. I already did. Healing a bear long distance from being paralyzed is fairly far out. That's pretty, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, but I'll share one that's a little easier for people to understand. And there's some video that they can go to online to see it. Perfect. So we had a wolf called Apricot. Don't ask how she got that name. I was going to say that's an unusual name for a wolf. Um, she was a sweet, lovely, passionate being, and she came down with this temper to the brain. How, we don't know. And it's considered 100% fatal. But like I said, that's based on vets who are used to domestic animals. She didn't want to die, so she didn't. <laughs> And, but she had symptoms. It's almost like she had some form of epilepsy. Her eyes were crossed and she'd walk funny. And I couldn't bear to see her that way. And the only thing Western medicine could offer was prednisone to decrease inflammation. And that would shorten her life and didn't feel right. So I loved her. Um, I loved them all. And I just thought, Again, I was coming from a much more scientific background. These things didn't occur to me, except out of love, I was going to reach out anywhere, like I did with, to Penelope with Teton. Um, so I, there's this woman who lives nearby who works with human paralyzed nervous systems using craniosacral energy, trying to get the energy to flow better through the nervous system. And I called her up and said, would you mind working on a wolf? <laughs> and she said, yes. So we brought her, her over here and we have a beautiful year where we hold retreats and she wanted a more secure setting. So she wanted him, her inside. So my partner, Jean, brought her in. She hadn't met this woman before. She's a very shy animal. And she hadn't um, been in the yurt before. So she was pretty nervous. And just for the hell of it, I had a movie camera. Just who knew what was gonna happen. So you can see John helping her lie down, nervous. And then Jill, the woman, putting her hand on her neck. And almost instantly, she began to settle in. And all this is on film. After a little nervousness, and then you see this great big sigh. And she settles in for oh, close to 45 minutes of this energy, craniosacral energy work. Wow. And I had the camera right on her eyes. And then she got up and looked at Jill. And remember, I gave her a lick, walked around the yurt, came back and asked for more. Wow. And we did a couple more sessions that I filmed. 
one of which was on a massage table because Jean's knees were bad and it hurt him. So we picked her up and put her on a massage table and you see this wolf lying on a massage table in a deep trance <laughs> and she healed completely. Remarkable. She lived a full life. Wow. 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 So you're, you've shared how the human animal interface can heal the animals. We started by talking about changing minds, changing hearts, and changing the relationship with nature. So I'm wondering, how do the animals heal the people? How does your dog or cat heal you? It's, it's a communication, a companionship, a calming because of a communication, a companionship. I mean, there's all this research on if a person has a dog, and then the dog walks into the room, the person's heart rate drops. Mm -hmm. So on a pure physical level, that changes. It's good for the immune system. It's good for, go ahead. So what, I guess what I'm asking is a story of transformation that you've seen in a human as a result of the interface and the connection the reconnection with nature through one of the animals or any of the animals that you have? Well, as myself, I had no intentions of starting an institute. I hate administration. I'm no good at it. <laughs> um, the connection with the bull has completely changed me. But the two really good stories, and then I'm going to have to go in a bit, um, one of them it was is of Jill Robinson, who was a reporter in Hong Kong, somewhere in China, and they invited her to look at the um, bears imprisoned in basements in what they call crush cages for bile. They sell because I think bear bile is healthy, and so they put a drain into the bear's liver and drain out the bile, and they live forever their whole lives that way. And she heard about this. And she was a reporter. Um, and she was interested in animal work before that, but she went down and she was just horrified at what she saw. And as she was standing there, she felt this touch on her shoulder. And she turned around and the bear had reached out to touch her on the shoulder. And she said she felt it was a bolt of lightning that the bear was asking for help. And that was it. She founded Animals Asia. Some oh. six to 700 bears later that she's rescued, she started to change the culture in China and in Vietnam about bear bile farming. So that's one woman, one experience. You asked how it helps heal humans, right? Well. How do, like the awakening is really what we're talking about. It awakens, yeah. And for myself, too, first they're the wolf puppies, but uh, that experience with apricot said, there's something going on beyond what I understand. So it drove me to explore more. And I, and I always go to alternative, any alternative medicine that feels right now with an animal. And they've been remarkable healing, not always. And I use Western medicine when it's obvious, like with a broken leg or, or whatever. Um, but it could change, change my view profoundly and drove me to want to share. So you said that um, you do retreats and that on a limited basis, it's possible for people to come and, and be on your land with the animals. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how would people pursue something like that? How would they be able to go about that? It's on our website. And so your website is? Earthfireinstitute.org, named after that wonderful wolf. So it's earthfire, all lowercase, no space, just earthfireinstitute.org. Beautiful. And what, what summary would you like to share about what, how, what's next for humanity? What gives us hope? I think working with that transfer, the quality that I'm sensing and all over the world of people, the best part of people, best part of us being awake, awoken so that we take action with a larger view, not 
this is what I need to help my family right now. It's not going to do your family much good if it's wiped out by a flood. It's the thinking has to get broader and include all life. Um, but the the level of like I said with that touch me not plant of, of stories. Excuse me. It's like we're waiting. We're waiting to be helped. And there's a is great beauty there. And and the increasing awareness that nature itself, which is an absurd word to begin with, but um, because it's made up of a bunch of living things, it's not a noun really. Um, the beginning awareness that it's waiting for us. If only we could listen, that a forest would welcomes us if we walk in it in the right way. We're not aliens. We're not in, innately. We're not um, terrible things on the earth. I'm sorry, my wolves are going to howl, and I can't stop them. Let's listen. Coyotes. Let's listen. Let's listen. <laughs> and my dog. What a wonderful chorus. <laughs> The sheer vitality of life, if you will, gives me gives me hope. So life is irrepressible. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for for the heart opening. That's that's really what I I experience in you and in the work that you're doing is that you are truly truly reconnecting us to our place in nature that we're part of it and and helping us to remember that and i think that's a profound gift thank you thank you what were you going to say I was going to say, I'm not reconnecting people. That gives me too much power. I'm only um, showing the opportunity. And then it's the other person themselves who takes it. Thank you. Is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Oh, in five minutes, I'll remember, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know where to find me. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for Earth Fire. And um, I want to come visit. I, I want to speak to the bears and the wolves and the cougar. And um, I, it, my heart just sings, even just thinking about it. So thank you so much. What were you going to say? That's what gives me hope. How hungry people are for this. And if we can band together, lots of us little bits around the world, supporting us in it. Yeah. Because most of us want to do well. And, you know, you say it's a, it's a, um, a partnership. Mm. And that's what we get to remember. Because it's, it's been an otherness mm -hmm. instead of a, a partnership. A partnership, and I guess the last word I would say is it's a companionship. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. A healing companionship. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's another word. Healing and joyous companionship. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who are listening and who are opening your hearts to connection with nature. And I want to say thank you to our producer and my partner in crime here at Sustainability Now, Scott Billy. And until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.